Have you ever done something for the sole purpose of getting someone to think well of you? Like, honestly, you just cleaned your room so that your mom would say yes to the question you plan on asking her later. Or maybe you complimented your teacher to try and get them to like you more so they grade you easier. Maybe you even went to Switch Serving Day last month because you just wanted everyone to know what a great spiritual person you are. Why do you do good? Why do you care about doing what's right? Is it to be seen by others or is it to honor God? Like, do you do what is right because it is right or because you want people to think well of you? I remember for me in middle school how badly I wanted people to think well of me, how much I wanted them to admire me in literally every area of my life. And so I worked really hard to do the right things and know the right answers. Because first off, it felt really good to be seen as the smart one. And second, I thought it would keep me safe if people thought I was smart and not dumb good at stuff and not bad at stuff, and I came off as confident and not insecure. So being a know-it-all and a goody two-shoes was how I presented my good enoughness to others so I wouldn't be rejected by them. But what I didn't know then, that God has been teaching me ever since, is that what we do is really important, but it's not actually the only thing that matters. And in today's message, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture from the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus calls us not to just do the right things, but to do them for the right reasons. And that's why the main point of today's message, if you are taking notes, is this. Following Jesus is about more than just doing the right things. It's about having the right heart. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you so much for this time to dive into your word. God, I pray that as we do, that your word would fall on good soil in our hearts, that we would have ears to hear what you want to say to us, that we would have eyes to see what you want to show us, and that you would give us a heart by your Holy Spirit to understand how these words apply to our lives. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're diving into this section in the Sermon on the Mount, a new chapter, chapter six, where Jesus starts off by saying this, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your father in heaven. So Jesus is starting off in verse one with a warning because he loves us. What he's saying is don't do good things to be seen by other people. So he's raising the bar. And if you were here for our last series, then that probably sounds really familiar to you. Because in the last series, we learned all about how Jesus was raising the standard on how we act and what we do. But thankfully, that's not all he came to do. He also came to get to the heart. Because following Jesus is about more than just doing the right things. It's about having the right heart. And when we practice our righteousness to be seen by others, we actually miss out on the better reward. This would be like virtue signaling. And virtue signaling might win you a reputation, but it will rob you of intimate relationships. Now, when I say virtue signaling, what I mean is the things that we do to show others that we are a good person who cares about the right things. Maybe for you, this looks like posting on your social media about some social justice issue, not because you really care about the people involved, but because you don't want to not say something because then people might think something. Maybe it's wearing a certain t-shirt with slogan on it that advertises that you're someone who cares about the planet or mental health, and maybe you really do, but you really want people to know that about you. Maybe you're serving in the church and you are so consistent with it, like you make sure to check in with your leader every single week so they see your great attitude because you need them to know that you're the good kid out of all of your siblings. Again, virtue signaling might win you that reputation, but it will rob you of what you actually want more, genuine relationships. 
So what do we do? How do we become the kind of people who do what's right because it is right, who do good to honor God and help others, not just help ourselves look good? Well, the answer is we pray. (laughs) Because at the heart of the Sermon on the Mount, smack dab in the middle of the greatest sermon ever preached, Jesus' manifesto on what life is like when God is in charge, he teaches us a prayer that is designed to help us get his words and his truth so deep into our hearts that it shows up in how we live our lives. And that prayer is what we're gonna be diving into in the weeks to come. But before we do, we're gonna look at what Jesus says about how not to pray. So let's start off in verse five of Matthew chapter six, where he says this, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So what do we do? We pray for an audience of one not for the approval of people. And I wanna draw your attention to two specific phrases that we just read in that passage. The first one is your room, and the second is in secret. What both of these phrases do is show us that relational closeness exists. On the street corners, Not so much, because you're only inviting someone into your room, your most personal space, if you're really close friends. And you're only spilling your secrets to people you really trust, not to some randos on the street. And this is one reason why living for the approval of people is so exhausting and isolating. And this was me through the first three years of high school. See, I was a leader on my sports teams, and so in one breath, I was leading through a team devotional or prayer time, and in the next, I was screaming in rage and punching a wall because I made a mistake on the field or the court, because I was a slave to the approval of people. I needed them to see me as perfect because I thought that my faults would drive them away. The reality was actually the exact opposite. See, I couldn't have deep, meaningful relationships with anyone until I stopped caring about their approval and started caring about them. Until I stopped hiding and hating the parts of myself that made me human and started being honest with God and with others. So my encouragement for us today is to check our hearts. Ask yourself these questions. Are you feeling exhausted? Are you feeling burned out from trying to maintain your image or impress other people? If so, that is your signal to come to Jesus genuinely and honestly. Ask him to teach you to live for an audience of one. Jesus continues on in this teaching in verse seven, when he says, and when you pray, do not keep babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. So what do we do? We pray to grow closer to the one who knows what we need, not just to get what we want. Think about it. Why do you beg or go on about the things in your life? It's because you're trying to convince whoever we are talking to to give us what we want. Like I remember growing up and asking my parents for things, and it was like a contest to see how many pretties we could stack on top of our please. We were like, please, pretty please, pretty, 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 pretty please, pretty please times infinity with ice cream and a cherry on top. My sister uh, got a little smarter, and when she grew up, she legit made a PowerPoint presentation with 20 reasons why she should get an iPhone. 
because she thought that if she was just persuasive enough or just said the right reasons or brought the right data point, then my parents would give her what she wanted. And man, how often have I treated prayer the exact same way? Like if I just give God the right reason or if I just crack the code of what he's looking for, then he'll give me what I want. But God's not a divine vending machine where if you type in the right code, you'll get the right snack. He's not a Santa Claus in the sky checking out a cosmic naughty and nice list to decide if you get presents or coal. And he is not some impersonable, unknowable force like the universe. He's a good father. So stop manifesting and repeating affirmations that have nothing to do with scripture to try and manipulate the universe or have the right energy. God is a good father who always wants what's best for his kids. So talk to him and tell him what you need. Because as Jesus tells us at the conclusion of this teaching, our father knows what you need before you ask. What does that mean? That means God sees you. He loves you. And he cares about the details of your life. So much so that he knows what you specifically need. He is the creator and king of the cosmos. And yet he wants you to relate to him as a father. What does that mean? Well, it means God is actually powerful enough to know and meet your every need. And he's loving enough to want to. I experienced so much freedom when I started to understand this and relate to God as my father. And it actually came during a season where I didn't get what I wanted. See, I was in high school and some members of my family started to struggle in their marriage. It was not looking good and it was breaking my heart. So I began to pray and ask God to hold this family together to fix what was wrong, to open people's eyes, to heal their hearts. And for months, this was my consistent and sincere prayer. And it was during this time that I was truly honest and actually emotionally vulnerable with God. For months, I was praying for an audience of one, not the approval of anyone else. I was praying to the one who knows what I need, who knows what they need, and not to get what I wanted. And it literally changed everything about my prayer life. And even though the situation didn't work out how I hoped it would, my trust in God as a good father grew, not diminished, because he saw me crying in my room. He cared for me when I revealed the depths of my heart and the fears I was struggling with. And he brought good out of details in my life and in theirs that I wouldn't have guessed was even possible. And I believe he will do that for you too, because God is a good father who always wants what's best for his kids. So if you aren't praying, it's time to start. And for those of you who are praying to impress people, check your heart, because Jesus wants you to be free from the burden of living for the approval of people. So you can live for an audience of one. And for those of you who are just trying to crack the code to get what you want, you need to trust that God is good, that he sees you, he loves you, and he cares about the details of your life. So trust his heart and ask him for what you need. And when you begin to pray like this, your relationship with God will be closer, deeper, and stronger than ever before. Because following Jesus isn't just about doing the right things. It's about having the right heart. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we get to come to you as a father, that you see us, that you love us, that you care about the details of our life. So God, I pray that you would meet every single student listening to this under the sound of my voice right where they are. God, some students are gonna take the step to pray, to cry out to you for the very first time. And I pray that they would feel and experience your presence in a way that they haven't before. Some of them, God, are going to pray not to impress other people, but 
to actually pray to an audience of one. So God, I pray that you would meet them in their room, in this secret place, and that you would let them know that you're right there with them. And God, others of them are going to stop trying to crack some code to get you to do what they want. They're going to ask you for what they genuinely need. And I know that brings a ton of joy to your heart. Would they experience your joy and your pleasure in these moments as they ask you for what they need and what's on their heart? God, we love you, we trust you. We thank you that it's because of Jesus that we get to come boldly before your throne of grace and find help in our time of need. In Jesus' name, amen. If that's you and you are taking a step to grow closer and stronger in your relationship with God than ever before, then I just wanna say, I'm so proud of you. And if you don't know actually what it's like to have a relationship with God through Jesus, then I want you to click on this video right here where my friend James is going to explain how you can start that relationship today. I'll see you there.